Welcome to Pretty Lies and Alibis. Let's seek the truth and travel the long road to justice together. What you know, alibiers? Welcome to another episode of Pretty Lies and Alibis. I'm Gigi. Good to have you here. It's Wednesday, halfway through the week. We're going to jump into part one of day 10 of testimony in the Chad Daybell trial. But first, if you're watching on YouTube, you know the drill. Don't forget to hit subscribe, like the video, share it with your friends, and you can ring my bell if you want notifications of when I post new content. Just click that little bell icon. Music fact of the day. What were the top five songs of the 90s? Number five, the 1997 version of Candle in the Wind by Elton John. Unbreak My Heart by Tony Braxton. I'll Make Love to You by Boys to Men. Number two, Macarena by Los Del Rio. And the number one song of the 90s, One Sweet Day, Mariah Carey and Boys to Men. Day 10, first witness on the stand, Brenda Dye, the coroner. She responded to the Daybell home after Tammy's death. She's been the Fremont County coroner since January of 2019, and she's also an EMT. She had very limited training to be a coroner. They have a two-day training in Boise, and then she attended a four-day training in Las Vegas. She does continuing education two to three times a year. Ada County in Boise, it's the closest place they take the deceased for autopsy. They don't do a lot of autopsies due to budget. Things like that, in my opinion, need to change. Rigor mortis is stiffening of the body. It begins about two to six hours after death, and it releases after approximately eight hours. That can help determine the time of death. To determine if an autopsy is needed, they look if a cause of death can't be concluded. Also, homicides and children who die get autopsies. She was working as an EMT the night Tammy died and got a call to respond to an unattended death. It took around 45 minutes for her to get there, and because it was going to take that length of time, she called the deputy coroner, who was about 10 minutes away from the Daybell home. There were several calls from dispatch due to Chad being so distraught. When she got there, Garth was emotionless to her. After she saw the body, she started to question Chad about Tammy's health history. Chad told her that Tammy was hanging off of the bed with her left face and the side of her head on the floor with her legs and feet still on the bed. When he discovered she was deceased, he called their son Garth to come help put her on the bed and they covered her with a blanket. Just a trigger warning, we are gonna be talking about some graphic things here, so this is your warning to click off if those things bother you. She observed rigor mortis and lividity on Tammy's back and her abdomen was cold to the touch. With the abdomen being cold to the touch, that is one of the last things to lose body temperature. It told her Tammy had been deceased for quite some time. And the lividity, which is the pooling of blood, after you die, gravity just pulls that blood down. It told her Tammy died on her back. There was a kitchen towel on the bedside table with pink blood-tinged sputum on it. Chad said he used the towel to wipe her face. Interestingly enough, we didn't see any smear marks on the photos I saw last year, but that's what he said. Chad said he felt Tammy roll off the bed around 6 a.m., which woke him up. She wondered how that was possible if Tammy had been dead for hours. He said it could have been when he pulled the sheets and rolled over, and that rolled her body. He said she would also sleep with her feet out of the covers due to menopause. She said his explanation of him pulling on the sheets made sense at the time, but looking back, it doesn't. It would take a lot of force to roll Tammy's body out of the bed. He told her Tammy had been feeling off in the last few months and was feeling outside of her body. She was having fainting spells and they were at the temple and she was kneeling at the altar. When she stood up, according to Chad, she fainted. Chad said Tammy had low blood pressure, but did not go to the doctor and would treat things naturally. She said there were a lot of oils and home remedies in the medicine cabinet and a natural remedy book on the bedside table. Chad told her Tammy tested her blood pressure on a drugstore machine. They go through the coughing fit and the events before Tammy passed away vomiting going back to sleep. She also said that Garth admitted to sharing Tammy's anxiety medications with her. At this point, she had responded to under 10 unattended deaths at that time, but now it's around 20 to 50 a year. They estimate the time of death based on the last time Tammy was seen alive 
as well as the lividity, the rigor mortis, and the body temperature all go into their determination of a time of death. At the time, she determined the cause of death as pulmonary edema, which is a backup of fluid and blood in the lungs, and a cardiac event due to low blood pressure and fainting, which was reported by Chad. The shaking fits and the seizure-like activity Chad reported played into her findings that this was a natural death. The decision of whether or not to do an autopsy is up to her. She talked to Chad about it, and he didn't seem to want it or not want it, but Tammy's daughter, Emma, did not want the autopsy. More recently, she amended the cause of death on Tammy's death certificate to asphyxiation by suffocation and the manner of death as homicide. After Tammy's body was exhumed and autopsied, and she was present for that, the medical examiner found Tammy had deep bruises. She also said it didn't make sense that Tammy threw up before she died because she still had stomach contents. All of Tammy's organs were healthy, but when they dissected the lungs, there was a large amount of foam. That was two months after she died, and that much foam should not have been present in the lungs. Arizona police contacted her for her coroner records. They told Miss Dye about Charles's murder and the attempt on Brandon, and Chad's name was brought up along with Lori Vallow and Alex Cox. She said if she had known this information at the time, she definitely would have done things differently. All of this played into her decision to change the cause of death and the manner of death on that death certificate. She says she regrets her decision to not order an autopsy, but at the time, with her limited training and being new, she did the best she could. That was it for direct and cross. I'm going to tell you guys, it was nasty and it was hard to listen to. At times, Miss Die regularly cleared her throat. And to me, when I clear my throat that way, that means I am trying not to cry. He was vicious, and I understand he's trying to defend his client, and this is a big part of this case for Chad, but still. He said, you discussed the case with the FBI in Rexburg, and you said your training. You took a two-day seminar and a week-long conference in Vegas. What areas did they cover at the conference? She says cause of death, the time of death, and just a wide variety of subjects. Pryor asks about Idaho Code Title 19, Chapter 43, and asks, did you read that as part of your responsibilities as coroner? And she says yes. He asks, when a county coroner is informed a person has died, the coroner shall investigate the death, and if that death was suspicious or unknown circumstances or occurred as violence, if you determine there's an issue, you can request an inquest if you have any concerns under the statute. You are to notify the police and ask them to conduct an investigation. The witness says we did have an officer on scene when she was found. He said you told the prosecution lividity, and he calls it lapidity the entire time, y'all. Lapidity. It caused her concern. Was that a concern that would cause you to step back? And she said at the time, no. He says there were no fresh bruises on Tammy. And the witness says, yes, there were on her arm. She said at the time, it looked like an old bruise to her. Pryor points out, you used the words old bruise on your report. They weren't red or fresh, were they? The witness says she can't answer that. Again, Pryor says on your report, you said old bruises. And she says, yes. He asked if there were any bruises anywhere else deemed suspicious, and she said no. Pryor asks if there were any indication of trauma on the neck or any kind of scratch marks indicating a struggle, and she said no. He points out Chad was sobbing and distraught, and you noted his son was not upset. In the FBI report, you said maybe his son was in shock. Then he says on Tammy's side of the bed, you found the essential oils and cough medicine, the witness says, no, we didn't find the oils. We found the book about natural remedies. He asked if she recalls finding the medication for bruises. She does not. They talk about a body chart on Tammy where they document any markings on the body, and they bring that up on screen. It shows lividity on most of Tammy's backside, and Pryor asks if that would be consistent with her dying on her back. She says yes. He says, and if she fell to the floor, like Mr. Daybell said, there wouldn't be any lividity on her head. She says no. He asked if it would be consistent. She was in bed for over five or six hours based on the lividity, and she said yes. He points out again on the chart, she put old bruising and nothing else. Then he says you're required to do a thorough exam, and you did. She had foam in her mouth and old bruises on her arm. 
The witness says yes. He points out that the coroner said it's my decision to decide if an autopsy is done. He says before you sign a death certificate, you have an obligation when you put your signature down that what you're signing is true and accurate based on the information at the time of death. And she agrees. He says Tammy vomited and you said she had contents still in her stomach. Did you ask Garth if he bought her a quarter pounder with fries? And then he goes on to ask if she saw potatoes or a quarter pounder in the contents of Tammy's stomach. She could not identify what the food was. He says, so we can't say she didn't throw up. Then he asks again, Chad is sobbing and crying when you arrive? Yes. Then he asks, is Chad's story consistent with the lividity findings? Yes. He lists a bunch of oils Tammy used. Chad said she had 10 bottles on the table every morning. The witness says there is a photo of the oils in the cabinet. Pryor said you were told she had shaking fits and seizures. You made an assessment and signed a death certificate saying this was something other than homicide or murder. And she says yes. Pryor asks if Emma told the coroner that Tammy was having trouble keeping up in clogging classes and the witness says yes. He asked if the officer in Arizona told her Chad was not implicated in either case, being Charles or the attempt on Brandon in Arizona. She said Chad's name was mentioned with Lori. Then Pryor says, but they didn't say they were pursuing charges against him. Just a note here at this point, nobody was charged with Charles's murder. It was not until last year, I believe, that they announced Chad would not be charged. Pryor says, at the point you talk to officers, you decide to look into it more and you help get an order to exhume Tammy's body. Did you start an inquest into this matter? She says she can't answer that. He says, yeah, you can. You did read the statute. You have the option to start an inquest. There's an objection. The witness says, no, she did not start an inquest. Pryor says, instead, you started working with the police and prosecutors. There's an objection that's sustained. The witness says at that point, we were working with the FBI and other agencies. And Pryor says, oh, the FBI was involved at that point. He says, you're supposed to notify families regarding suspicious deaths and let them know what's going on. The witness says, I believe that was done. Pryor says, what family members did you let know they're digging their mother out of the ground? The witness says, I worked closely with law enforcement. And Pryor says, I didn't ask what you did with investigators. I asked what family members you told they were digging their mother out of the ground. Pryor says, were there other suspicious circumstances you were looking at? And the witness says, suspicious activities. Any other event that would result in homicide? Pryor says, you were looking to change your conclusion to homicide. He said, I'm not talking about the situation with Charles or Brandon. I'm talking about the fact that when Tammy was put in the ground, it was lividity and that was it that you noted. The witness says, no, part of my decision went into the past history I was told about by Chad. Pryor says, you knew Tammy had a history of anema and the witness says, past history, not current. Pryor said, you had no evidence she had been cured of anemia and the witness said her medical record said past history. Pryor says you saw she had a history of heart problems, and the witness corrects him and said there was a family history. Pryor points out Tammy didn't like to see doctors and relied on homeopathic remedies. The witness says that's what she was told by Chad. Then he says you decided with all of this, we're going to dig Tammy Daybell up. You were going on a fishing expedition to dig Tammy up and come up with another cause of death. There was an objection that was sustained. He asked, after Tammy was dug up, where did the autopsy take place? And she said, in Utah. On redirect, all the information you relied upon was from Chad. She says yes. The prosecution asked, did Chad bring up Lori, Alex, the attempted murder of Brandon? No. She's asked, you approximated she was dead five to six hours before you arrived on scene. You were asked about supplements and over-the-counter medications that were on scene. Is it possible for you to know how long those items have been there before you got there? She said no. Prosecution asked, is it possible someone put those supplements on scene before you arrived? She said yes. She's asked, you filed an original and then an amended death certificate. Why is that? She said the results of the autopsy and JJ and Tylee were dead at the same residence. The prosecution asked, did Chad inform you of JJ and Tylee? She says, no. You were asked about the bruising. Do you have the expertise to age a bruise? She said, it looked old to me, but I'm not an expert. You were asked about informing the family if there's further investigation and exhuming a body. 
why didn't you do that? The witness says the detectives and officers, I believe they informed the family. That was her understanding. They ask how cooperative was the family during the investigation? There was an objection that was sustained, but kind of interesting that question. You said Chad was sobbing and upset. Were you able to observe if a few weeks later when he was marrying Lori Vallow? Of course, there's an objection that's sustained, but the jury heard it. Come on, y'all. Did Garth give you information about her health? She said no. He only shared that he did share her depression medication. What from the autopsy made you change the death certificate? She said the expertise of the medical examiner and the investigation into the other deaths. So, of course, Pryor gets up on a recross. He said the prosecuting attorney suggests someone ran out, bought supplements, and planted those. It's not realistic, is it? The witness said that could have happened before. That was the end of recross. The next witness, Kelsey Harris. She was a student in clogging class with Tammy as well as a co-worker of Tammy, and they were friends. They would have conversations more than just a hello. Tammy started taking these classes at the end of August or early September until her death in October of 2019. She would go one week for an hour. She was there every class. She never remembers Tammy falling behind or getting tired in class. There were no issues at all. No problems keeping up with everybody else in that class. The witness also attended a high fitness class, and she stood side by side with Tammy. The class was twice a week for an hour each time. Tammy went regularly up until her death. Again, she was able to keep up and do this high-intensity workout with no problems. At work, Tammy was fine. There was no indication of any health problems and nothing about her struggling or not keeping up. Tammy never complained about her health, and they talked all the time. On Cross, Pryor asked when those classes started. It was the end of August or beginning of September, and Tammy went for a total of around five classes. But it's important because this is when Tammy supposedly is in failing health, and every witness is saying she was fine. Pryor says she only went to one high-intensity class, and the witness said no, she went to more. Then Pryor goes a little low here, and he said, would you describe Tammy's figure as someone who was extremely fit? The witness said, I would say she was a very fit woman. Pryor says you would. Then Pryor says her daughter Emma went with her mom to the high-intensity class, and you saw them that one time. The witness says also in my clogging class, he asked how many people were in the clogging class, and she said seven. Pryor points out, if there were issues, you were in the front of the class, but Emma would be the one to see it. On redirect, the prosecution asks, is there any doubt watching Tammy and her performance that you're confident in what you told the jury about Tammy and how she performed? Yes. The next witness, Shannon Miller. Love this lady. She was not taking it from Pryor. She taught at school for 30-plus years, worked with and knew Tammy. She was actually on the committee who interviewed Tammy for the job and hired her to be a librarian and a computer technician. She attended these high fitness classes with Tammy and Emma beginning in 2018 up until Tammy's death. The witness was on the back row and could see Tammy during the class. She said it's very rigorous. She said at first, when they first started coming, Tammy and Emma could not complete the exercise, but as time went on, after the first couple of months, Tammy could complete those workouts. I've done them. It does take you a couple of months to really get your body trained to be able to finish them. A few months before her death, she never saw Tammy lagging behind. There were no breaks Tammy had to take, and she kept up with everybody else just fine. She saw Tammy several times a day at work, and from the time Tammy started those classes, she became more confident in herself. She was in great health, and seemed to be in great shape. She never got tired at work or struggled to complete any of her tasks. She was shocked when she heard Tammy had died because just hours before that, she saw Tammy at work. She was happy and healthy, talking to the kids as they were going to lunch, complimenting them, smiling, and seemed perfectly fine on cross. They ultimately conclude that this woman did not know Tammy in 2017. It was actually 2018. But Pryor says, in your probation period, you get life insurance, and in the second year, you can increase the benefits, right? The witness says, I don't know. Pryor says, but you worked there. And the witness says, that was a long time ago for me, and I didn't up my death benefits the second year. Pryor says, ironically, you met her in 2018 and started these classes at the same time and became fast friends. The woman said, we became friends when she started working at the school. 
He says the high-intensity classes started in September of 2019. The witness corrects him and says no. She and Emma had been attending a year and a half prior to her death. They started because Tammy and Emma wanted to get in shape for a 5K, and co-workers said to come to the high-intensity class. He says Emma was there as well, standing next to her mother, and did you watch Tammy the entire time? The witness says off and on, you look around and see how others are doing. And there could be as few as 15 in that class, but up to 30, just depending on the night. Here he goes again. He asked, would you say Tammy was fit with low body fat and petite? The witness slaps back and says, you don't have to have a low body fat or a petite figure to be fit. She had the stamina to complete the rigorous workouts up until her death and prior was done. He was not going to stir that hornet's nest again. The last witness before lunch is Jennifer Geisler. She's a first grade teacher at Tammy School, saw Tammy daily, ate lunch with her, and said they were good friends. She describes Tammy as bubbly, happy, somebody you want to be around. She also attended this high fitness class with Tammy. She actually was the one that invited Tammy and Emma to come try it for an hour, and it was two times a week. Tammy attended both classes each week. She said some songs you turn around and you can see the back row and she would often see Tammy and Emma giggling and having fun and doing their own dance moves. As the class ends, they punch Tammy's card. She said Tammy loved it and have fun. She kept up in the class, never had to stop and take breaks. Mind you, this is up until her death. She last saw Tammy the Friday before she died. They ate lunch together. She was happy healthy, talkative, sitting by her son, Seth, who was actually there substituting. And she was just shocked when she heard she passed. On cross, Pryor says, you told Officer Mattingly Tammy had been in the Zumba class for four months and you didn't know if she was doing the low or high intensity workout. The witness says, I told him I didn't see her every song during the classes. He asked, you would have to turn around to observe Tammy. She says, yes. Pryor points out, Emma was standing beside her every class, yes. Pryor says, you say you were good friends, but you never went to her house. And the witness said, well, we talked during the day at school. He says, Tammy and Emma spent their lunches together. And the witness says, no. Emma taught third grade, and her lunch was later in the day, but sometimes she did interact at lunch. On redirect, Emma and Tammy did more of the high fitness when they came to that class. That includes burpees, jumping jacks, all the things that make you breathe hard and sweat a lot. They asked the witness if, since she ate lunch with Tammy, did you observe her eating habits? The witness said she always commented that Tammy would take all the vegetables. She ate super healthy. On a recross, Pryor says, when did Tammy start the high fitness class? She said, we actually started Zumba a long time ago. The class switched over to a high fitness class. Tammy and Emma started at least four months prior to her death. The defense says, well, how do you know it wasn't shorter? The witness says, I knew they were coming longer than four months. So that was it before lunch. Kudos to Tammy's friends and coworkers for making very clear this story about Tammy failing in health the last couple of months. They almost make it as if Tammy couldn't stand up straight. These women are saying she was there every class, totally rocking it, doing her thing. Boom. Can't dispute that. Who's got the motive here? Chad. All right, guys, that's it. We'll see you later this evening for part two. Have a good rest of your afternoon.